So um, I'm going to do this little presentation again. My name is Megan Myers. I'm an assistant professor of Spanish and affiliate faculty in U.S. Latino Latina Studies here at Iowa State. And if you haven't seen a Pecha Cucha style presentation before, it's something we do sometimes in our Department of World Languages and Cultures. The normal format is 20 slides, just one or two image, no text, 20 seconds a slide. It's really fun. I'm going to do a modified format, just seven slides, about a minute a slide. But the goal for this brief presentation today, uh, Lucia asked us to talk about what Latinx studies really means, right? And I'm going to come at it from kind of a personal, but also professional and research-based um, approach this morning. So let's do it. I'll give you the little fingers. Okay, so I'm going to start here. Um, as an undergraduate at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont, a small liberal, liberal arts inst institution. And um, I'd always wanted to study Spanish. And I went to Middlebury College so I could study languages. And at this point, I think my parents were still holding out that maybe I would double major in business, right? Instead, I picked up two minors in education and Portuguese. And I pledged my heart to humanistic inquiry. And I really never looked back. Um, but I want to outline two really formative experiences for me as an undergraduate that really guided my undergraduate career and has really shaped my own personal and professional life trajectory. The first, and this relates to these two photos here, is a student organization I founded alongside two other undergraduates as a sophomore at Middlebury College called Juntos Migrant Outreach. We worked with migrant workers on rural dairy farms in Middlebury and surrounding areas. And this was really the first time that I, I lived and experienced and had this really raw and personal connection to thinking about issues like immigration reform, immigrant rhetoric in rural areas like Vermont, and also anti-immigrant rhetoric. And I really became invested in this, in this studies and what Latinx studies means. Um, this is a picture here of my dear friends, and I still talk to them all the time today. They're growing up, Jonathan and Jason. Um, and I worked primarily with those migrant workers who had families in Vermont. And these two boys are really special to me. And for me, it kind of really began, my interest in Latinx studies began with Jonathan and Jason in this Juntos program at Middlebury. The other really formative experience for me was leading an alternative break trip to the Dominican Republic to a farm, a sustainable coffee farm owned by Dominican American author Julia Alvarez and her husband Bill Eckner. And um, the rest is really history. And I say the rest is history because this trip as a 19-year-old jump-started my passion for Dominican and Dominican-American culture, literature, politics, music, you name it. The Dominican Republic became the focus of my research as an undergraduate writing a senior honors thesis and later my PhD dissertation and recently um, my, my book. Um, but part of this history was one that I had no previous knowledge of until I was in my late 20s. Um, I'm going rogue here. This picture here in the circle is a picture of my great-great-grandfather, whom I didn't know lived in the Dominican Republic for over 15 years until I was in my mid-20s. He became a naturalized citizen managing sugar plantations outside of Santo Domingo. So it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I realized I had this other familial ancestral connection to La Isla um, that I had felt already. So I say today that I have um, two Dominican families, my great-great-grandfather and my great-grandfather, who also lived outside Santo Domingo, and also my hija my two sweet godchildren, Maria Liz and Marisol, and my own daughter is Marcela, so I call them my three mares, and um, my compadres, who are my dear, dear friends today. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how this ties into my research as well, and where Latinx studies falls or kind of um, materializes, right, in my research today. This is uh, the title and the cover, rather, of my recent book publication with the University of Virginia Press in the New World Studies series, Mapping Hispaniola. I'll give you my brief elevator synopsis, right, elevator speech synopsis of the book. Um, Mapping Hispaniola considers how both geopolitical and metaphor metaphorical borders are construed in literature, in particular in Dominican and Dominican American liter literature of the 20th and 21st centuries. So I'm really interested in alternative, non-antagonistic literary representations of the Dominican-Haitian relationship. Um, and I'm interested in how these relationships are challenged, um, not only in the space of Hispaniola, La Isla, but also in the US diaspora. 
Um, and my book project, hence the title Mapping Hispaniola, also contains a few maps. So I'm really interested in mapping geospace and literature, so the way that different space and border space material, materializes in some of these 20th and 21st century novels. But I'm also interested in looking at data, and this map in particular uses 2010 census data to plot the intersection of Dominican Americans and Haitian Americans living in New York State today. So I ask how diasporic space shifts and alters relationships that cross national, racial, ethnic, and linguistic borders. Thank you. So the other thing I discuss in my book and that I also bring into my classes here at Iowa State um, connects to international engagement work. I'm one of the founders and organizers of Border of Lights. If you haven't heard of it, Border of Lights, Frontier Limier Yo, or Frontera de Luz. We are an organization, a volunteer-based organization that originally began in 2012 as a way to honor the lives lost in 1937 Haitian massacre, also known as the Parsley Massacre. If you've never heard of this ethnic genocide before, in 1937, the then dictator Rafael Leonidas Trujillo ordered um, the approximate number of 15,000 Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent murdered along the northern border region of the Dominican Republic. And this event, Border of Lights, not only honors the lives lost, but also, and sometimes more importantly, it also celebrates the legacy of solidarity and camaraderie along the Dominican-Haitian frontier. So you might think, you know, what does Border of Lights have to do with the diaspora, right? Where is Latinx studies in, in, in an event like Border of Lights? And for me, it's, it's everywhere, right? We have partnerships with We Are All Dominican, which is a diaspora-based grassroots organization that focuses on supporting the legal rights of Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic today. Um, one of our earliest supporters and still very active supporters today is Silvio Torres Sayant, who founded the Dominican Studies Program in New York State. Um, and most of the organizers and founders of Border of Lights are diaspora based. Um, in fact, I'm currently working on an anthology with Dominican historian Edward Paulino at John Jay College. And I recently interviewed Julia Alvarez about her um, involvement with Border of Lights and her work and kind of her literary legacy. And she said this, um, and I quote, she talks about how Border of Lights is um, an event that, in which the diaspora goes back and reseeds their roots with new ideas, end quote. Great, so thank you for listening. This is my really quick Pachachuca seven minute personal and professional way to talk about what Latinx studies means to me as a teacher, as a scholar, um, as someone engaged in local and international communities. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of this program here at Iowa State, and I'm very honored to be an advocate and a friend and a mentor for Latinx study, or students on campus and an engaged scholar um, here in the state of Iowa. I also just wanted to give a quick plug to our hashtag, so it's front and center. Um, as a digital native, I really wanna push this, so please share, share pictures, share thoughts on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on Snapchat, wherever you are, whatever you're using, please share and, and connect us digitally today as well. So thank you again for being with us and thank you for, um, for listening, thanks. And some words from Dr. Dot Brian Beankin, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to welcome to you all. Um, like Dr. Myers, I would like to um, I would like to thank you all for being here. Um, um, thanks, that this, you know, especially to all the hard work that's gone into this program. And like Megan, I want to shout out uh, Dr. Suarez who put this thing together. It's a Latino Studies anniversary, but someone has to shoulder the majority of the work. And that's what she did. And, and I don't think that I, and I don't think that you all perhaps understand just how much work went into it. I don't know why I ended up with all the gray hair and she did not, but uh, uh, a special thanks to, to you for sure. Um, so I think it's interesting how, how Megan set her um, thing up, because I'm going to do a very similar um, talk, I think. Um, but I also think our disciplinary difference, are, 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 you know, the differences in disciplines are, are interesting, because what I want to do is basically make an argument. I think that's a very historian uh, thing to do. And the argument that I want to make uh, in, is in regards to, um, to diversity and our understanding of that term. And so you see my title, How Diversity Shaped Me. The argument that I want to make is I think too often often 
at universities, especially and in society more generally, we hear that term diversity and it's thought of, especially by white folks, I would say, it's thought of as what people of color bring to the table and what, you know, how basically we can, we can benefit from that. Um, the argument that I want to make is actually diversity is really a two-way street. Um, and in fact, I have benefited from being in a diverse and in integrated environment my whole life. And that has actually led me down a path to be the person that I am today. So before I tell you how I became professor and, you know, uh, uh, Mexican American, African American historian, like expert and all that kind of, all that kind of jazz, I want to start with basically who I am. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so I was born in 1973 in Houston, Texas. Uh, this is uh, me a year after my, my brother was born. Um, I got the cool vest. Uh, you'll, you'll notice with several of the pictures, I have really cool shirts, and I'm still kind of proud of that. Uh, something that I do today is wear, wear cool t-shirts. Um, my family is, just in case there's any confusion, like to get, to get it out of the way, right? I'm white, right? This is a very, my family is very stereotypically white, uh, you know, sort of uh, a middle class, uh, suburban white family. Um, but I credit my parents with, with doing a number, of thing, a number of things right as parents. I think most importantly, what they taught me from a very early age is that I was um, equal to everyone. I was no better than anyone else, and I was to treat... Uh, uh, people that I encountered with respect and dignity. And I think that really matters because uh, they could have brought me up in a, in a world of white superiority, right? In a sense of being better than, and they, and they didn't do that. And so they did little things like, certainly, you know, we had black and brown neighbors and friends, but they did little things like if they would hear like the, the neighborhood kids, let's say using a racial epithet, it would be that we don't do that. We refer to people of color who are, you know, back in the day, it was like, we don't refer to black people with words like that, or we don't refer to Mexican people. And I think that's like a minor, minor thing but if you don't do that, you know, what kind of message have you sent to your children? And if you teach your children that they're better than everybody else, what kind of message uh, have you sent? So I think that's, you know, it's like I'm talking about diversity. It's like, here's my white family. It's kind of it cracks me up a little bit. If we could go to the next slide. The other way that I want to talk about how diversity matters, though, is just in the in the education that I got. So when I went to school, uh, my generation was really the first generation to go to completely integrated schools in Houston, Texas. We were in what's called the Aldine District, the second largest district in the Houston area. And my entire life going to school was always in an integrated environment. And I think that really is important. And I, and I can give you examples of sort of the, the flip of that. Uh, my wife especially, um, and she's African-American, um, she has had experiences here at Iowa State where, you know, these white um, um, rural kids will come in and they'll say, you're the first black person that I have ever talked to. I didn't ever have that experience because growing up, my friends were always black. They were always brown. They were always white. Uh, can you find me on there? So you have to check out the cool Van Man shirt, oh. and that's where you'll see that's me, right? Like I still want that Van Man shirt, but you can see what I'm talking about here. Where you have where you have a very integrated class. If we could go to the next one, uh, th the other thing that matters in this regard is I had. Uh, I had role models to look up to who were themselves people of color. So this is Mrs. Ragsdale. She was, she was my teacher. Um, having a, an African-American teacher, what that meant is that the district didn't just integrate the students, right? They integrated the staff as well. And so having that role model and that kind of representation, I think we know uh, really, really matters. If we go to, oh, wait, wait, wait. Do we find me? Yep. Way over there. Uh, if you look for the ears. It's the giveaway, I tell you. All right, if we can go to the next one. Uh, so this is me in seventh grade football. Again, I want to make the same point that I just did. This is Coach Jones, and then the yellow shirt there, that's Coach Yost. Um, anybody want to take a guess at what Coach Yost did at, uh, at my middle school? I mean, he has to be a teacher, not just a coach. Good try. Where, where are we at? 
history. He was the history teacher. He was the coach. Um, but again, you see both the, the, the coaching staff and the, uh, and the players, right? We have, uh, you know, it's a totally integrated environment. I'm number 47 there. If you can find 47, that's, uh, that's me, right? There I go. Okay, next one. And so this is my graduating class. I think, A, it shows you, again, this extreme sort of diversity. This is like one-fifth of the entire picture. Um, we had a huge graduating class, almost 700 students. And I want to make a further point about the whole diversity thing, because what happened to me when I was in high school especially is that type of diversity began to extend sort of beyond friendship and to, uh, you know, a greater friendship and ultimately, uh, you know, a relationship and love. And so that's me way up at the top there. I don't look very happy. It was hot, I guess. But then I want to point out where she is. Okay, so there's this person right there. Can y'all see that, that nice, beautiful black face right there? Hey, okay. that person, next slide. That person is that person, and that's me. <laughs> and that person is sitting right here. <laughs> So, so I, yeah, I got to know Monique when we were in when we were in tenth grade, basically, and we started dating in high school, and you know we've basically been partners uh, uh, ever since. And I think that's you know that's the other important part for me as far as diversity is concerned, is it led to something that I think is very beautiful and, and very special. Um, and I wonder, you know, I wonder sort of the but fours, like if that hadn't happened, where would I be? Where would my life be? You know, what, it certainly would have been much, much, uh, you know, much different. Um, but, you know, that's that sort of relationship and that um, environment, I think, really primed me for who I was going to be once I got into college. And it took me a little while to get into college and get finished. But once I did, I got a bachelor's degree in Houston from the, uh, for, in history from the University of Houston. And then I started graduate school. And I knew I wanted to do work on the civil rights movement, but I wasn't really sure like what kind of new direction I wanted to go in. If we go to the next slide, please. And then in doing research, I took a research seminar as first year graduate student. Um, I knew I wanted to work on the civil rights movement. The professor said, you know, go look at the archives locally because you can't like go to Alabama or Mississippi or someplace like that. So I went to the, the public library in Houston and I found the papers of Felix Tijerina. And Tijerina was the longest serving president of the League of United Latin American Citizens or LULAC. It's the sort of, especially in the 40s, 50s and 60s, the premier Latino uh, Mexican American civil rights organization. They did a lot of, they're oftentimes conferred, c c compared to the NAACP, did a lot of similar things. And I was fascinated by this guy because he did a lot of education activism. He worked on a, a, pre, a preschool bilingual ed program. He did a lot of like civil rights stuff for Mexican origin people, but he was also a white supremacist. He believed that Mexican origin people were white. In Texas, they were legally classified as white, and the Jim Crow system in Texas was blacks on one side, whites on the other side. So strategically, there, there's an argument that's made that like we're not black, so we must be white, so we don't get segregated. The problem with that is he coupled that sort of strategic thing with outright anti-black racism. And in particular, at one point where the NAACP actually came to him and said, let's work together, we're, we're stronger if we're united. He very famously said, let the Negro fight his own battles. His problems are not mine. I don't want to ally with him. And what that meant is that he as the president kept uh, this major other civil rights organization and a lot of other Mexican origin people from working with black people. And I was fascinated because all of those pictures of folks that I showed you before, they, those, those students would have been, those Mexican American students would have been offended to have been considered white. Even if they weren't like proud raza, right? They were, they were, they considered themselves brown and this idea of being a white person would have been really bothersome to them. I, I don't get this guy, like this makes no sense to me. And I kept looking for a book that would explain it to me. Like where, where am I gonna figure out this guy and I don't get it. Where's the book gonna come from? I need to find this book and I couldn't find it. And so next slide please. So I wrote it. Right? 
Um, so this is my first book. I did a comparative history of the African-American and Mexican-American civil rights struggles in Texas, which really delved into this idea in particular of whiteness, but a lot of the other things that kept black and brown people from working together. I also do a lot looking at coalition building and in particular how coalitions can form but then ultimately how they can, how they can fall apart. I followed up this work, if we go to the next one, I'm not running out of time, with um, a, a couple of other different books, all of which look at this issue of, of race and ethnicity and civil rights and racism and, and you know, basically focus on uh, diverse uh, topics. And the last thing I wanted to point out, last slide please, uh, well, I, I have a current project on policing, um, so, so law enforcement. I'm going to skip through this one really quickly. The last one. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out is here at Iowa State, where this work is really translated the most, as, as far as I'm concerned, is, is education. You know, when people ask me, they're like, what do you do here? I tell them I'm a diversity educator. And they, they always ask me, like, what does that mean? And then I explain what that means. And what it means is that in the classroom, you know, I educate students, and it used to be when I started, predominantly white students. You know, we would have diversity courses, and they, white students were there to get their diversity credit. And what's happened over the past decade is we're getting a lot more students of color in class, and, and they, they want to know about their own communities. And so that's part of what I do. Um, so there, there are two pictures of me teaching, but then I love, we do these group panels in my class where each like group of students will, will look at, in this particular case, it was the Latinos in business panel. But I love this image, right, because the guys, they all dressed up, you know, ties and all that stuff, and they just did a, a great job. Um, so that's my little history, and again, my argument for um, diversity, and especially how diversity uh, shaped me. And again, I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for listening.